Am I starting or is somebody else starting? I'm going to start and tell them all about how awesome you are. So. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Catherine Huckabee. I manage the community engagement office here with the city of Fort Worth. And with me is Ruth Aussie, Ruth Wade. She's in the background handling uh, all the translations this evening and making sure that we get all the questions on Facebook Live. We just want to thank you for joining us tonight. Um, for this a very important uh, workshop that we're offering as a part of the city of Fort Worth's fourth neighborhood improvement program. As most of you know, this workshop would normally be held as a part in person. Uh, but this time we're still doing all of our workshops virtually. So WebEx and Facebook Live are helping us be able to maintain social distancing. We really want to thank um, the Las Familias de Rosemont Neighborhood Association for allowing us to be able to use their Facebook platform to be able to reach as many neighbors as we can. This workshop is going to cover code and development services, and you're going to hear how to partner with your code compliance officer and the development services department to deal with illegal dumping, litter, substandard structures, obtain permits, zoning and board of adjustment issues. Um, if you have any questions, please use the chat function to the right if you're logged on to WebEx and send in that question if you're joining us. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, please use the comment section. This workshop is being recorded and will also be available to share with your neighbors on next door on, on the city's website later on. Uh, we're going to introduce Councilwoman Ann Zeta from District 9 in just a second. But first, we'd like to have Ruth Ossie go ahead and translate. Buenas noches. Uh, soy Ruth, soy la sede de integración comunitaria de la ciudad de Fort Worth. Y quiero dar las gracias por acompañarnos en este taller virtual como parte del cuarto proyecto de mejoramiento de vecindarios de la ciudad de Fort Worth. Este taller normalmente se llevaría a cabo en persona, pero en este momento estamos haciendo todos los talleres virtualmente a través de WebEx y Facebook Live para ayudar a mantener el distanciamiento social. También quiero agradecer a la Asociación de Vecinos de Familias de Rosemont por permitirnos poder usar su plataforma a través de Facebook Live para poder llegar a tantos vecinos como podamos. Este taller es sobre cómo asociarse con su oficial de código de cumplimiento y el Departamento de Servicios de Desarrollo para lidiar con basura ilegal, estructuras de caídas interior, obtener permisos, zonificación y junta de cambios de ajuste. Si en algún momento tiene alguna pregunta, use la función de chat para enviar una pregunta si se une a nosotros en WebEx. Si se une a nosotros a través de Facebook Live, use la selección de comentarios. Este taller quedará grabado y estará disponible para compartir con vecinos a través de la aplicación de Facebook y Nextdoor. Perfect. Council and Zeta, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I just want to reiterate how important it is that neighborhoods engage in this effort. And even in the face of COVID, which has been an interesting way to carry this forward program, I mean, this program forward, um, I think that we are doing good work that is actually going to benefit neighborhoods beyond Rosemont. But we are here today to, to help the residents of Rosemont um, avail themselves of all of the services that are available to them through the city and partner with them to improve their neighborhood. So welcome and I look forward to the presentations this evening. Uh, buenas noches, ella es la concejal Anzeira con la ciudad de Fort Worth y nada más quería dar las gracias por atender. Este es uh, un proyecto importante que están haciendo en la área de Rosemont. Aún en la fase de COVID estamos haciendo un buen trabajo por proyectar y darle a conocer a todos los departamentos de la ciudad y los servicios que tienen disponibles para ustedes. Uh, no quiere tomar mucho tiempo de ustedes y vamos a comenzar con el taller. Thank you, Ruth. So first up from Code Compliance, we have Ken Young and his trusty sidekick, Shelly Garcia. So I'm going to let Ken start. Hi, everybody. My name is Kenneth Young, and this is Officer Shelly Torres. Uh, oh, 
<laughs> I will not live that down. Okay. <laughs> you got married on us. So. <laughs> it happened. Yes. And we uh um we both work with the neighborhood stability unit for co-compliance, and we just kind of want to go through a quick slideshow, kind of let you know what co-compliance does does as a as a department and what we've been doing in the Rosemont Neighborhood Association. Uh, mi nombre es Oficial Torres. Este es mi supervisor, el señor Young. Uh, nosotros tra trabajamos por el uh, Departamento de Código de Cumplimiento um, en el vecindario, um, en esa área de Rosemont, por este proyecto especial y le queremos dar los datos, lo que uh, hacemos desde abril de este año, desde 2009. No, those so the code compliance department is made up of five main public service areas, animal care control, code enforcement, and code enforcement includes neighborhood investigations and building standards, our consumer health department, environmental quality, and one of our larger groups is the solid waste services. That includes the residential service trash, recycling, bulk collection, drop-off stations, litter abatement, illegal dumping, something a lot of people don't know, street sweeping, and environmental investigations who goes out and inspects and tries to find the culprits who illegally dump materials where they don't belong. Tenemos en este departamento cinco áreas de servicio públicos, por ejemplo, el control de animales, Los oficiales de código que vamos a investigar los vecindarios y edificios. El um, Departamento de Salud que va a investigar los restaurantes, los uh, centros de, donde cuidan niños y uh, la calidad del, uh, como del aire y los ríos. Ellos chequen a ver si hay algo peligroso y el Departamento de Basura Sólido Es el servicio residencial, el reciclaje, la basura grande, las estaciones por donde puede llevar su basura, uh, basura que está tirado ilegalmente y también tenemos la, nos encargamos para ba barrar las uh, calles. Yeah. Neighborhood investigations is what a lot of people used to know as our field operations people. Uh, we have been in the Rosemont area uh, since roughly in April. And just like they said earlier, due to COVID, this has really been a different project than we've had before. Just to let you know, up to date, we have had 428 cases, we've had 635 violations, and we've closed, which means the citizen has corrected 381 violations in the area. Los investigaciones que comenzamos en esta área de esta fecha tenemos 428 uh, 635 y 381 cerrados de el, el dueño de la propiedad ha corregido. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Our building standards department, uh, the side of code compliance that it does the building standards inspections, they have two types of properties. They have substandard properties and they have ha hazardous properties. Hazardous properties are something that is identified that is an immediate health hazard. During the time at Rosemont, there's been eight hazardous structures identified, one primary structure, which of course is the main house, six accessory structures, which, which could be detached garages or storage buildings, and one commercial structure had all been identified as hazardous. So far, one residential primary structure has been repaired from this hazardous list. Ok, um, estamos ahora hablando de las uh, expectativas que están peligrosos 
identificamos ocho. Una que era la, en la mera casa, seis que son accesorias, por ejemplo, el garaje o algo así, y uno comercial y uno res, una uh, residencia, propiedad uh, se ha reparado. Substandard structures, which are structures that are not so bad that they're actually hazardous to somebody's health. There's been 34 of those structures identified during the Rosemont project. Of those, 15 are primary structures, which are the main houses. 18 were the accessory structures. Once again, the detached garages, uh, sheds, and one commercial structure has been identified as substandard. Okay, durante este proyecto, uh, había 34 estructuras de bajo nivel que se identificó. 15 so eran las um, casas, 18 garaje y uno era una estructura comercial. Our solid waste service, which includes, of course, the regular trash pickup, the bulk pickup, um, they've been working really hard. Uh, so far, as far as weight goes, 70 tons, seven zero tons of litter and, and illegal dumps have been removed from the Rosemont area. Now that has cost the city roughly uh, $1,500, but that's a really small price to pay to try to help improve in that area. The street sweepers and the cleanup crews, the litter abatement crews, they have cleaned 1,154 actual miles up and down the streets of the Rosemont project since the project has began. That has accumulated almost 3,000 staff hours and there's been five citations written to people for illegal dumping. Okay, durante este proyecto han levantado 36 yardas cúbicas y hasta esta fecha 574 y um, el peso de la basura que se ha levantado, por ejemplo, basura que está tirada en uh, lotes vacantes o en la calle son cuatro toneladas y hasta esta fecha es 70, 70 toneladas. El costo que nos costó era 1,455 uh, líneas uh, y mías que se han limpiado son 1,000. 154. Las horas que han durado hasta esta fecha son 2,989. Y ya damos cinco multas para gente que ha tirado basura ilegalmente. Solid waste litter abatement. <clears throat> we have a program that's called the Clean Slate. It works with the Presbyterian Night Shelter. And they walk, they, they're the people a lot of times that you'll see in the yellow vest walking up and down the streets with the little grabbers and they're picking up all that litter off the streets and off the corners. The hours since the beginning of March, they've been, the hours they've spent in the project area is 2,910. They've cleaned 140 lots and a total bag count of full trash bags, they've taken away 3,641 bags since the beginning of the project. También en el departamento de sólido de la basura, tenemos una, un equipo uh, que son de cinco personas que se llama la pizarra limpia y solamente están uh, limpiando basura de la calle de derechos de la vista. Uh, Lo que hacen también es limpian los lotes que uh, nosotros somos dueños de la ciudad y limpiando basura de las, cur de las curvas. Uh, las horas que han ponido uh, limpiando eh, todo eso son 2,910. Los lotes que se habían uh, limpiado son 140. 
y las bolsas de basura llenos de basura que hemos levantado es 3,641. Our consumer health team and the com commercial enforcement team, which is part of our consumer health team, they've, they've only had 24 cases open to date, which is really good. They've issued two citations and one of the cases that they have closed. Okay, el Departamento de Salud del Consumidor, también tenemos oficiales que se encargan de los negocios especialmente durante este, en esta área. Ahorita, hasta esta fecha, tienen 24 pasos a, a, abiertos. Uh, han dado dos multas. Um, un caso se ha cerrado. No sé uh, Y eso es mucho, uh, muy bueno porque nomás se encargan de los, uh, los negocios. Ok. Animal Welfare Activity, which this is our Animal Care and Control Group, they've had 213 service calls to the date. Now, there's a lot of different calls they do, strays at large. Uh, they've run one stray patrol where they just take a vehicle and go through the area looking for strays. They've had uh, some cruelty and neglect uh, calls over there. Uh, they've caught 23 animals. Uh, they've They've taken 26 injured or sick animals, and they've had four of the owner uh, freely giving up the animal. So they've been very busy since that started. Okay, el Departamento de Control de Animal hasta esta fecha han uh, recibido o contestado llamadas 213 de servicios en esta área. Uh, también asistieron la policía, uh, pescaron 102 que estaban sueltos. También uh, había un día a ver si podían uh, a encontrar a alguien. Tenían 13 casos de crueldad, de negligencia. Um, y también había un equipo que fueron y levantaron como 26 que estaban heridos o enfermos. Uh, y eso es todo. That's it for uh, kind of what code compliance is compressed, uh, uh, comp combined our department of, uh, and that kind of gives you an uh, uh, outline of what we have done uh, since we started in there in about March. We did have a few questions come in. Uh, Fernando, did you want to sure. speak? You can go. You're still on mute. Oh, there you go. My bad. Okay. No, thanks, Ruth. Yeah. So I just wanted to know um, what is, uh, I've heard a lot about citations and violations. Uh, how is that being translated? to the neighbors, what's the process behind that? What does engagement in COVID era look like right now with code and this project and everything? So, la pregunta era, ¿cómo es uh, que el código de cumplimiento se está uh, comunicando con los residentes, especialmente ahora que están en la era de COVID? Um. The, the, the citations uh, are always a last, last ditch effort to try to um, gain uh, compliance with whatever the city ordinance is. Um, the, the different groups, whether it's solid waste, uh, animal control, consumer health, uh, the, whatever they issue those citations for, um, it's something that's that they've worked and tried to work through before. Uh, a citation is always one of the last ditch, last ditch efforts. It's never that. It's never that first off the truck trying to trying to issue it. Um, with 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 COVID and everything like that, we still try to reach out to everybody. We try to make contact through phone, 
uh, leaving business cards and phone numbers, asking them to call. Uh, anything that we can do, of course, trying to keep the citizens safe and keep us safe, but we do try to always make contact. Uh, as far as once a citation is issued, there has been some different things set up through the municipal court system on how they are handling those. Uh, and if there's any other questions about how that's being handled at municipal court, I would ask somebody to, to get in contact with them so they can find out exactly what's going on down there. Yes. Okay. Uh, lo que estamos haciendo sobre las multas es no es um, no estamos dando multa con la primera visit, uh, visita que estamos ahí. Estamos tratando de, de trabajar con la persona por carta, tratar antes que pasó de COVID, uh, tratar de hablar con la gente si estaban ahí por teléfono, dejamos cartas. Um, tarjetas de negocio y todo eso y la multa desgraciadamente es la última cosa que tenemos que hacer y uh, los cortes están tienen su sistema ahorita sobre el COVID realmente no sé cómo están trabajando eso creo que también pueden pueden poner cita por, por lo que estamos haciendo ahorita no sé realmente porque el teléfono de ellos está detrás de, de la atracción Ok, pero otra pregunta es que cuando los vecinos están, este, le dan una multa, Ajá. este, el proceso que, que el vecino tiene que tomar, eso después va este, de, del departamento de cumplimiento a las cortes. Eso es el segundo paso después de que le dan una multa a un vecino. No, después que damos la multa... Uh... Uh, ahí le van a van a recibir una cita con el corte. Nosotros uh, ya hicimos lo que podemos y cuando va al corte, depende de lo que dice el juez, no sabemos porque nosotros después de la multa nomás nos presentamos a corte. Uh, he asked, you know, after a citation is issued, is it to code or the court? I told him that once a citation is issued, they'll get a court date in the mail. And uh, it, it gives them directions or instruction. Ahí hay instrucciones de con quién hablar, uh, uh, cómo se va a tratar el caso y todo. Ok, y después mi última pregunta es, ¿cuántas visitas dan este, el oficial de complemento de, de code? ¿Cuántas visitas dan antes que den una multa a un vecino? Pues realmente uh, damos dos o tres. Hacemos lo más posible porque antes del COVID, lo que tenemos que hacer, lo que es requisito, un requisito, es tratar de uh, hablar con alguien. Uh, you know, sonar la puerta, si hay un teléfono, si hay un vecino que, que nos puede decir quién vive ahí, algo. Tenemos que hacer lo, lo más posible para hablar con alguien. Y, y luego en eso, le mandamos... Y, Dejamos una, tarje, una carta en la puerta si podemos o se la mandamos por correo. Okay. Y si vemos que están tratando de hacer algo, vamos a seguir trabajando con ellos. Pero hay, hay casos que no contestan, nadie nos habla para atrás y pues es la, el único uh, resultado. He asked, uh, a question about how many visits. Is that correct, Fernando, before the ticket is issued? I, I told him we do everything in our power to make contact with the citizen of the property owner. If we're able to get on the property, knock on the door, we leave a business card, we leave the letter on the door, and if not, we'll mail it to him. So. And like the, like some of the citations that were issued by solid waste, that could have been for illegal dumpers that they have found illegally dumping materials on private property or public property. And, you know, in, in a situation like that, that illegal dumping can go anywhere from a, uh, a, a local municipal citation all the way up to a felony. So sometimes in a situation like that, it may not be as long as if, uh, if, if we were writing a citation on a water leak or something like that. So it, there, there, there is a few differences, but generally speaking, um, outside of that, we do try to, 
we we do try to exhaust all all avenues to uh, speak to people, educate people, and gain compliance. Ken and Shai, can y'all talk to them about the process of how how you are even called out to view something, whether how, what how you get notified. There's two different ways. In a in a in a project area, in a, in a project area, it, it, there we do get two different ways. One way is that we are tasked with going through and looking at all the properties. But we also do have citizens that file complaints and we work those complaints while while we're in that project area. Uh, the the group that's working in Rosemont right now is a specialized group that we will work this project until this project is completed. Then I will take those officers and I will put them in that next project area. So, you know, you have a regularly assigned code officer there and any complaints that he is receiving, he forwards them to us so that we can work them. So that way we're not we're not doubling up. We're not officers show up to the same house to 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 talk to somebody about a violation. Okay, quiero quiero decir también el señor uh, Fernando preguntó uh, antes uh, cómo tra trabajamos el caso y le expliqué, pero también tenemos unos oficiales que se encargan de la basura que tiran il il ilegalmente. Y hay veces ellos no um, si pescan a algo a alguien es una multa y depende el tamaño el peso de la basura puede ser un misdemeanor o un, una fel fel felonía. So, y eso es lo que pasa con eso. Y también la señora Hakipi preguntó cómo reciben quejas y cómo trabaja eso. Y mi supervisor dice, como este área era un proyecto, no, los oficiales que están trabajando este proyecto no están encargados de esa área todo el tiempo. Somos un equipo como de cuatro o cinco que nos metemos en una área y miramos todo, pero también hay veces que recibimos llamadas. Y después que acabamos ahí, nos dan otro otro proyecto en otra área. Thank you. And then, Kenneth, if you can just have our our Rosemont Code Compliance Officer just reach out directly to the neighbor, just so we can build that that friendship uh, relationship with him. Or okay. her. Uh, el señor el, uh, Fernando preguntó que le mandamos un mensaje al oficial que se encarga de, de esa área todo el día para comenzar una amistad y que se hablen uh, para comunicarse y educarse. Do we have any other questions, Ruth? Sorry, we don't. <laughs> okay. Let's see if you can. Okay, Laura's got it. Okay, so next up, thank you very much, Ken. Y'all you. took your mask off. I appreciate it. Yeah, good night. I guess I'm chopped liver, huh? <laughs> I'm so shally. <laughs> <laughs> Our friendly neighborhood uh, co compliance. <laughs> so next up, we have zoning, our second most favorite department until Kenneth gets off. And now you're our first, you're our favorite department now. So Laura Evans is going to join us now. Laura, the screen is yours. Thank you, Catherine. Um, good evening. I'm Laura Evans. I am a senior planner within our zoning and land use section. Um, so what I'll be going over is very kind of high level general overview of what zoning is, is and how the process works. And um, I'm hoping to save a majority of my time for questions because I feel like that's the best way to learn about zoning essentially. Um, let me see. Okay. Uh, so, buenas noches. Su nombre es Laura Evans y ella está con el Departamento de Desarrollo. Es una planificadora um, con la ciudad y hoy va a estar hablando de lo que es zonificación y qué significa para la ciudad. Um, va a tratar de hacer su presentación rápidamente para poder responder a preguntas del vecindario. So, um, generally what zoning is, it's Part, it's how we implement a portion of the comprehensive plan, which is the future land use map. Um, and with zoning, we're wanting to promote orderly growth and protect um, existing property owners um, to make sure that um, 
their communities develop a way that we think is beneficial to them. And um, that, for example, um, zoning regulations are designed to help with traffic and um, provide more safety, such as keeping, you know, our really heavy industrial uses away from our single, single family neighborhoods. Um, and we're one, not too large of a concentration of any one sort of use um, in one area. And it's really to provide that activity between live where you work and where you need to go for other items. So, la zonificación uh, realmente es el plan com de comprensión de la ciudad y ver cómo se puede desarrollar una área o la ciudad para que no se uh, haga mucho, muchos uh, negocios en una área, asegurando que sea una comunidad conveniente, atractiva y funcional, uh, que promueve salud, seguridad, las regulaciones de zonificación y distritos se han diseñado para reducir tráfico, proporcionar seguridad contra peligros y que no haya mucho casas en una área, muchos negocios en a todo alrededor de la ciudad. So, um, the way zoning in Fort Worth works is essentially al alphabetically. And so I have a few uh I just generally go over what the letters mean. So when you look at a zoning map or you look up your property, you're going to see a letter on it and um, it could mean a variety of things. Um, so our first district is um, A, which is our single family district, which means only one unit is allowed per lot. Um, and then there's a subcategory with numbers afterwards. So the most common one you'll see is A5 and the five stands for a minimum size of 5,000 square foot lots. Um, it, it goes up that from there we have up to um, two and a half acre lots essentially. Our second category is B, which is two family, and that allows for two units. Lot R1 and R2 are um, essentially the smaller, smaller lots, so kind of your townhome developments. R, C, and D are our um, common multifamily um, dis districts, and they're each. Um, they're different maximum density allowed. So that's the number of units per acre, essentially. And um, UR is our highest density um, multifamily district, and it has more of a form based, which means the design of the building is more important than in the other districts. And we want to have, um, it's more of an urban feel with a dream ability. Si usted uh, busca su dirección, cómo funciona la zonificación es por el alfabeto. Si busca su dirección, va a estar acompañada por una letra o un número y cada uno quiere identificar una cierta área. A significa familiar. Uh, el número indica el tamaño máximo del lote. Si es A5, lotes de uh, 5,000 pies cuadrados o A10 serían lotes de 10,000 pies cuadrados. Dos familias B puede ser duplex adosados o separados en un lote. R1 y R2 es la línea de lote de cero, de cero y casas adosadas. C, R y C y D son distritos residenciales multifamiliares de densidad baja, media y alta. Y el último será um, en esta página sería UR que es multifamiliar basado en formularios de alta densidad. Densidad. Quiere decir que el diseño de esta área va a ser más importante uh, que en otras áreas. The next districts, um, we have our commercial districts, which are um, E, R, E, F, R, F, and G. And so they're just different intensities. So usually in a, in a single family neighborhood, your most common district will be E. Um, and so the main difference between E and F are the allowed uses in F um, are auto related, um, pawn shops and um, bars. And then G is the highest intensity, which allows um, essentially all commercial uses except for industrial uses. The R on ER and FR means that uh, no alcohol sales are allowed whatsoever. Um, the next districts are I, J, and K, which are our industrial districts, and they just go from light to medium. I mean, light, medium, and heavy. 
Um, we also have some special purpose districts, which um, are ag for agricultural, which means the primary use of the land is animals. CF is community facilities, which is primarily used for um, school and church related uses. And MH is our manufactured housing district where um, manufactured houses are allowed. The final one on this slide is PD, which is a plan development. And so each PD also has a number related to it because they're essentially their own mini zoning ordinances where you can um, kind of customize um, the zoning to fit that development, such as additional uses or development regulations. So la segunda parte aquí son los distritos comerciales. Uh, distritos comerciales EROE son van a ser comerciales en un vecindario uh, y F comercial general. La diferencia entre estos dos son que puede dejar que sean um, ubicaciones como pawn shops, bares o lugares donde se componen los carros. G es comercial, pero es intensivo y industrial. La segunda parte son distritos industriales y generalmente son ligeros, medianos y pesados. Los distritos de propósito especial o de agricultura, instalaciones comunitarias de CF, son um, fabricadas o ca casas que son manipuladas. El desarrollo de planificación, la última parte es PD, a menudo se usa para agregar usos de cualquier distrito a base o a cambiar el estado del desarrollo. So son especialmente para una área um, y se pueden son flexibles y pueden dejar que sean comerciales con diferentes tipos de zonificación. And um, so this is a kind of an incomplete pyramid essentially, but this is how our zoning is laid out. So they're partially cumulative. So at the top of the pyramid, you have single family. Um, and then below that you have all the other districts. So for example, if you had a piece of property that was zoned D, um, which is our high density multifamily, all the uses in the categories above that are also allowed. So you could have essentially a single family home on a piece of property that didn't have that zoning. Um, and this and goes for the commercial district. So if you have a piece of property zone K, you can do all the uses that are listed in the E through J um, categories. Esta gráfica es uh, una pirámide incompleta de la zonificación parcialmente acumulada. Los usos residenciales de menor densidad están permitidos en distritos residenciales. Um, eso quiere decir que si usted tiene una propiedad con zonificación D, también se dejaría la zonificación A, B o C. Um, pero los usos residenciales no están permitidos en los distritos que no sean resi residenciales. So, si son industriales, ya no se podría tener ese tipo de propiedad. Um, here's a, these are, I'll go quickly over these because these are more in specialized areas. Um, we have mixed use districts. We have eight, which is only for downtown. And then we have MU1 and MU2, which are, um, are low and high intensity mixed use, mixed use districts, which that just means that it allows for residential component as well as a commercial component. Um, the design districts are in specific areas. So you have, and I'm sure you know, you know parts of the uh, city pretty well. So we have the Panther Island near Southside, Camp Bowie, Trinity Lakes, uh, Barry University, and the Stockyards. And they all have their own um, special zoning ordinance. Esta parte de la zonificación uh, son áreas mixtas, pero son especiales porque son específicamente para esas áreas. Um, la letra H es en el centro, MU y M2 uh, son uso mixto de baja intensidad o de alta intensidad. Y también tenemos distritos de diseño especial. Y este es un uso específico para esa área. Um, y fue pedido, o so tuvieron que pedir el proceso para tener ese, esa zonificación específicamente. Y serían áreas como Panther Island, Camp Bowie, um, Trinity Lakes, Barry, o por la calle de la University. And then, so in addition to zoning, we also have overlay districts, which have additional regulations. So the most common one is a historic overlay, which um, would go through the historic commission. So that's the demolition delay, um, historic or cultural landmark, and the historically significant endangered. 
We also have several airports in the area, um, and so they'll those each have their own um, overlay. There's also the TCU residential overlay, overlay, which limits the number of unrelated persons that can live in a single family home. And then um, we have a few design such as um, downtown and then a portion of North I-35. And then we have a new overlay, which is a conditional use permit. And so this is essentially if you um, a commercial zoning district that and you're wanting to add one use, you're able to do that through the conditional use permit. So you're not changing the zoning, you're just adding a new use to that property that previously wasn't allowed. So, siguiente tenemos um, las supersticiones, que son reg regulaciones además del distrito de estunificación de base. Uh, una superstición puede ser histórica, puede ser histórico o cultural, que es HC. HCE son históricamente en peligro. Por los aeropuertos en el área también tenemos superposiciones del aeropuerto. Uh, en la área de TCU, también hay una superposición que dice cuántas personas pueden vivir en un hogar. Uh, tienen distritos de diseño en el centro uh, y por la área de el 35 hacia el norte. Pero también hay permisos con condición que son CUP. Y eso quiere decir que puede añadir un uso a la área de zonificación que no estaría allí normalmente. So that's all of the letters essentially in the zoning district. And then this is just kind of a snapshot of the ordinance. Um, it's pretty large, it's over 500 pages. And so each letter category you saw has its own regulations. Um, and each category also has its own uses that are allowed. Um, so essentially each category would have a page such as the, the right that shows you kind of your development regulations such as setbacks and height. Um, and then there are additional sections in the ordinance for things such as landscaping, urban forestry, and signage. So, cada distrito de zonificación tiene una página con reveses básicos y otros estándares. Uh, los usos permitidos se pueden encontrar en las tablas de uso, que son varias páginas. La ordenanza también tiene estándares suplementarios, principalmente cuando son comerciales o industriales. Uh, cada ordenanza tiene cosas específicas sobre qué alto puede ser, cómo se debe ver, um, por si, por la parte de afuera. De la propia. And so this is just a snapshot of what the use chart would be. So you can see if there's a P in the box, you could go to the, the zoning district on the top and the uses on the left. And so you can see what uses are and are not allowed in each uh, zoning district. Eso solamente es una tabla que dice cuáles son los usos permitidos para cada área de zonificación y los puede comparar con otros. Así puede ver qué es lo que se permite en la propiedad que usted tiene. And so, um, this is, so most people want to know what their um, property is zoned for a variety of reasons. And so there are two really easy ways. Um, one is to go to our interactive zoning map on the website, which is at um, map it.fortworthtexas.gov slash zoning, and then you'd have to input your address and zoom in. Um, a really easy way is the one address site where you, um, you go to one address.fortworthtexas.gov and you type in your address at the top of the page. And then it lists a whole, a whole bunch of information essentially that more information you could possibly think you that you um, needed to know. And one of those use, one of those um, things is the zoning district. You can also email us at our um, our zoning land use email or call our main number. We can help you navigate the website or just look it up for you if you need to. Uh, muchas personas quieren saber cómo es que averigua la zona que es su propiedad y lo puede encontrar en el sitio de web que es mapit.fortworthtexas.gov barra zoning. Pero una manera muy fácil de hacerlo es por ir al sitio de web de One Address y simplemente pone su ubicación o su dirección y le daría a qué tipo de zona es su propiedad, pero si necesita asistencia adicional, puede mandar un correo electrónico o puede llamar para hablar con un empleado que le puede decir qué tipo de zona es su propiedad. And so um, now I'm just going to go over um, the rezoning process. So if you're wanting to rezone your property or if someone around you is rezoning their property, um, it's 
um, I'll just go over the different steps. And so the first step is obviously an application. So uh, we have a checklist on our website that kind of tells you what we need um, for that. But one of the main things is making sure that either you are the property owner or you have the authorization of the property owner to rezone that. Um, as, and so you submit that application. Um, after we have the completed application, we email courtesy notices to any um, registered neighborhood organization within a half mile of that site. Um, and then um, we submit, send in the mail uh, the legal notice, and that is to any property owners that are within 300 feet of the site. Um, we also place a sign on the property um, at least 10 days before the hearing. So after those um, items are done, the public hearing is held. The first one, it's the zoning commission, and it's on second Wednesdays of every month. At that time, anyone can speak. It's a public hearing. So anyone that wants to speak in favor or opposition of the case is allowed to speak. And at that point, the zoning commission will make a recommendation of approval or denial. And then after it goes to zoning commission, it goes to city council the next month. And those are typically held during the um, first Tuesday of every month. And again, it's a public hearing. So anyone may speak in favor or opposition of the case. and. That is where the case is ultimately approved or denied. So, varias personas quieren saber cuál es el proceso de rezonificación. El solicitante debe presentar una solicitud y es importante que tenga el permiso o sea el propietario de esa propiedad. Con la descripción legal, uh, siempre recomiendan que el solicitante se comunique con la oficina del vecindario y con el concejal antes de enviar una solicitud. La ciudad envía por correo electrónico avisos de cortesía dentro de la primera semana a las organizaciones vecinales registradas dentro de media milla. El personal revisa el caso y se envía un aviso legal a los propietarios en un radio de 300 pies. Diez días antes de la audiencia, se coloca un letrero en la propiedad. También se lleva a cabo una audiencia pública con la comisión de zonificación el segundo miércoles a la 1 p.m., Todas las personas pueden hablar a favor o en contra y se lleva a cabo una audiencia pública en el, la reunión del Consejo Municipal. Los casos de zonificación generalmente se escuchan en la primer, primera reunión del mes, los martes a las 7 p.m. y todas las personas pueden volver a hablar a favor o en contra uh, la si tú se aprueba o se niega en este punto. And so this is what um, the neighborhood, the courtesy notice would look like. And so the front page is kind of just general information about how the process works with the notification. And the second one is the map that shows the site and then the half mile uh, radius around it. Um, so essentially, whenever the courtesy notices are mailed out, they're mailed out to specified people that are part of that um, neighborhood association, such as the president, vice president, if they have a zoning chair. And then it's that person's responsibility to um, send that information out to the rest of the neighborhood organization. Um, so usually whenever people get these, they'll talk, discuss them at their neighborhood meetings. And then there's this, usually a vote for if the neighborhood will support or to, um, oppose the request. And one of the main things to remember for our zoning cases and hearings is speak in person, that's fine, but we have to have um, your support or opposition in writing. We can't take a phone call essentially and have that and put that into the record. So if you're wanting to support or oppose a case, we would need you to send that to us in writing. And that can be through either the mail, or the address is on that courtesy notice, or you can just email it to us at that zoning land use email. So lo que ve en la pantalla es una notificación que se le manda a la membresía de un vecindario, puede ser el presidente o alguien que sea designado en una organización de, vec de vecinos. Um, solicite que se le devuelva sus inquietudes o comentarios uh, por escrito a las, al consejo, al concejal o a la zonificación. Discuta en su reunión de vecindarios si y este programa antes de las audiencias de la comisión de zonificación o del consejo. Uh, es importante que claramente uh, defina las preocupaciones principales de la propuesta. Si responde, está preparado con ejemplos um, y es importante que sean por escrito y que no sean por llamadas, um, si no es en persona. 
And then, so this is what the notice looks like. If you're, if you receive this in the mail, that means you're within 300 feet of the site. Um, it's very similar to the courtesy notice. Um, however, this one has a little tab at the end, bottom you can cut off and mail back in. Um, and essentially it's the same thing as the courtesy is we just need something in writing or you need to speak in person. Um, and finally, um, a state law is if more than 20% of the property owners within 200 feet of the site oppose a case that will require a supermajority vote at city council for approval. So if you have, you know, 20, more than 20% of the people in the area oppose it, when it gets to council, there would have to be seven votes in favor of it to approve it. So if they'd only received six, then it would just be final. Los propietarios que reciben una notificación por correo uh, serían esos que están dentro de 300 pies. Uh, pueden ignorar la notificación o enviar la parte inferior de la hoja con comentarios o asistir a las reuniones. Para ser contados, todos los comentarios deben ser por escrito. Uh, no podemos tomar nada por teléfono. Las inquietudes o comentarios deben devolverse al personal o empleados antes de las 3 p.m. los lunes antes de la reunión. Si más del 20% de propietarios en, dentro de 200 pies del, del sujeto de la propiedad que quiere cambiar la zonificación está en objeción por escrito, la aprobación para cambiar esa zona requiere un voto de mayoría absoluta, que serían siete de los nueve miembros del concejal. And uh, one more thing to note is you're not required to do anything if you receive a notice in the mail. Um, you can ignore it, you can send something in. Purely optional. Um, I just wanted to make sure that that was noted. Um, una cosa importante es notar que es totalmente opcional. Si quiere ignorar la carta, no tiene que dar comentarios. Si no está en oposición o no quiere ser parte del proceso. And that was my presentation. And again, that's the, our um, our main phone number and our main um, email address for any questions. Ese es su so before we go to any questions, I have two questions I want to make sure are answered. So first of all, just in case anyone is on and does not know who your neighborhood association president is, Fernando, can you wait? <laughs> Act important. So Fernando is the president of Las Familias de Rosemont. Fernando, what is your what is the process if you or another member of your board receives, this is a test, receives an early courtesy notification, what do you do? So what we've um, tried to do um, <laughs> and are still working on, it's a work in progress, uh, <laughs> is you know notify neighbors. I know in the past when we have gotten um, a zoning thing or developer come, we've, we've asked them to come to a neighborhood association meeting and kind of talk about it or come talk to the the board uh, and explain to us the process. Obviously, this is still something that we're still working on uh, and trying to figure out amid COVID and stuff like that. Yes, but I know that also Fernando team does a great job of posting it on their Facebook page and next door to make sure that all the neighbors are aware that they were notified of that. And then also I wanted to check with council member Zeta, if you wanna share who it is on the zoning commission that represents your district. My appointee to the zoning commission is Kimberly Miller. Um, and she has a very good background in planning. She is a planner herself, so she she's very knowledgeable. So I served on the zoning commission myself before being elected to city council um, for six years. And I will say that I was the mayor's appointee at the time, so I wasn't designated to a specific district. Um, and often zoning commissioners like to hear things in the public meeting, and not necessarily be contacted outside of the public meeting because they would like the information that they hear to be the same as the rest of the commissioners in the public hearing process. So I would encourage people to communicate through staff if they have information that they want to share with zoning commissioners. Perfect. Okay, what questions? Spanish translation, sorry. <laughs> um, 
La pregunta era que quién es la persona en la junta de zonificación que representa el distrito 9 en el área de Rosemont, pero también todo el área del distrito 9 en Council Member Jada, can you repeat her name? Kimberly Miller. Um, y su nombre es Kimberly Miller, pero si tiene comentarios o asuntos que quiere uh, reportar a la zona de zonificación o la junta de zona de zonificación, es muy importante que se lo dé a los empleados y al personal de la ciudad para que todos tengan la misma información y no solo sea una persona. And we did have a question come in, um, but Laura, you can let me know if this um, will be covered in the comprehensive plan. Is um, what are the city's visions or plan for a neighborhood? I think that would be more of a comprehensive. That would be um, listed under the comprehensive plan section. And so I think there was another question about what the general zoning was. Um, zoning is, for the most part, you'll have large areas zoned the same, but it's really a lot by lot basis. And so I would, if you're wanting a particular zoning district um, to look up each individual address, if you go onto our, the interactive zoning map that I previously mentioned, there's a layer called zoning fill, which you can turn on. And so each zoning district has its own color. For example, single family is uh, a bright yellow. So if you turn on that zoning fill layer and you kind of zoom out farther, you can get um, a feel for what the area is zoned. And um, Zach has some really cool maps He's gonna show everybody. So that'll, that'll also be shown <laughs> what the areas look like. Um, la pregunta era cuál era la visión para la ciudad y cuál es la zonificación general en la área de Rosemont. Uh, pero eso se va a discutir uh, más adelante. Vamos a tener un mapa donde pueden ver cuáles son las áreas de zonificación um, en su área. Susan, are you on the phone or Ruth, did you get Susan's question? Yes, I did. Perfect. I had a couple of good questions, if you don't mind. Um, first of all, I mean, Laura, thank you. That was a very thorough uh, presentation. <laughs> um, so just a couple of questions. First of all, so when you, you said there, I guess somebody said that there's going to be somebody else to be able to show us a map of what the zoning looks like in Rosemont, obviously, because we have a very uh, diverse and large neighborhood. Obviously, we have manufacturing in our neighborhood and we have single family homes and there's development going on. So the more educated the neighbor association can be to inform the neighbors, um, you know, the better that is. But you said there was um, a map that you're going to show later. Is that right? I, yeah, I think Zach covers some maps that are part of the comprehensive plan um, section. And so zoning. So just a quick different. Oh. Sorry, my computer. <laughs> okay. Thing is essentially like what's current on the land, what's allowed today. Like you go pull a permit for it tomorrow if you wanted. Um, as for the comprehensive plan, there's another map called future land use plan. And so for the most part, they usually um, kind of overlap perfectly, but there might be some areas that the city thinks will either redevelop over time or maybe the use that's there now is the most appropriate for the area. And so you'll see a different color. So, and so when someone comes in for a zoning change, we, like whenever I'm writing my staff reports, we refer to that future land use plan to see if what they're wanting to develop is compatible with that future land use designation. So they kind of have to work in tandem. Okay. okay. Yeah, just, <clears throat> just wanted to know, just cause um, I know a lot of our, our neighbors are renters. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, sometimes it could be difficult to get in contact with, um, with neighbors and stuff. I mean, with the owners of property and stuff yeah. like that. Also, if neighbors call in, uh, and want material, is this material in Spanish? And is there a translator in your department? So I'm not sure if it's available in Spanish. Um, mm -hmm. we do have a few Spanish speakers in our group. So if. For example, I've gotten plenty of emails and voicemails in Spanish, and I make sure to forward them to the person that can respond to them. Okay. And we can make sure that all the presentations that are shared throughout all of the workshops will be up on the website for the NIP programs. We'll, we'll get all translated for you. Okay. So, las dos preguntas eran si iba a ser un mapa que estaba disponible. 
y sí lo van a hacer um, más adelante en, durante la presentación, pero van a ver dos mapas, uno de uso futuro y uno de la zona, zonificación del área actualmente, que pueden ser diferentes, depende de lo que la ciudad planea en el futuro para esa área. Y la segunda pregunta era si hay alguien disponible o si la información de zonificación está disponible en español. No estamos seguros si todos los planes que tiene la ciudad están disponibles en español, pero si hay empleados que hablan español, si tiene preguntas o dudas sobre algo que esté cambiando en su área. We did have another question come in, Laura, is that can you request zoning changes for properties other than your own? La pregunta sí. era que si puede pedir uh, cambios de zonificación de propiedad para otra propiedad que no sea de usted. So the short answer is no, you have to have the property owner's authorization to request a zoning change. Um, there is another way. So we have a process called council initiated rezoning in which um, either the council will see a place that isn't appropriately zoned or the neighborhood can come to the council person and request this. Um, and so essentially that how that works is there's usually an informational meeting with the affected property owners to let them know that this is something that's being proposed and it's kind of a public format to where um, there's that back and forth between the council person and staff and the neighborhood organization. And then through that process, to the, the city is essentially the applicant for that and we, we carry it through the rezoning process. Um, so that's the only other way that there is to rezone property that isn't your own technically. Uh, la respuesta a esa pregunta era que no y sí. Uh, <laughs> el propietario tiene que tener uh, el permiso. La persona que esté cambiando la zonificación tiene que tener la autorización del de propietario para poder cambiar la zona. Pero también hay otra forma donde es iniciada por el consejo de la ciudad uh, y también irían por el mismo proceso. Uh, y en ese caso, el aplicante sería la ciudad. Do you have more questions, Brianna? I just got two, <laughs> two questions and a statement. Um, so literally, so when, so say we have somebody, uh, let's say just a, yeah. the developer uh, come in and, and buy some property and wants to develop that, you know, what, what, can the neighbors or the neighbor association do um, in terms of that? If like, obviously you don't want too much of the same, you said in, in, in part of the presentation, you don't want too much of the same zoning or whatever to a certain area and stuff like that. And say, if you have a developer coming in and buying properties, trying to develop to put these ugly condo stuff on them, um, what power does the, the neighbors have so it'll depend on if if there's what the zoning district is and if that use is allowed so that's the first step so if he's if it's zone b which is our two family and he's wanting to build an, a duplex then for the zoning process which i spoke of there's nothing that i would be a part of in that because it would be allowed by right and it would be able to go through the permitting process if it were zoned you know a single family or duplex and you wanted to put up like a multi-family or more than two units on the lot then that would go through that rezoning process. Um, so whenever we have a an application come in, essentially every person that a developer will talk to, we will tell them to make sure you reach out to the neighborhood before you even submit your application. That's what I tell every single person I talk to, no matter how big or small the development is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so usually at that point, they'll reach, <laughs> thank you, Catherine, they'll reach out to y'all and like, um, you'll get the courtesy, they'll reach out to you and hopefully have the meeting before they submit the product, the, their application. And at that point you can say, we're okay with this or we're not okay with this. And like, kind of try to have almost a negotiation. Like if you, if you develop it this way, then we'll support your project. You know, there's a negotiation tactic essentially involved. And then through that, um, you'd be able to speak through that public hearing process. So as the president, you would be able, you know, if you take a vote through your neighborhood and you decide to support it, you come to those hearings and say, as president of this neighborhood organization, we have decided to support this developer or oppose it whichever way. Um, and I'll tell you right now, our zoning commission um, takes the neighborhood support opposition. It's pretty weighted. So they'll either, and so let's say like, if you support a case, 
they will either have the developer will either continue the case and kind of just give it a 30 day delay to have them meet with you and see if there is some sort of agreement you can come to or not. But you're you should be involved in the process. And speaking of the zoning commission, that's a good uh, lead to my next question. Um, so having a meeting uh, in the middle of the week at 1 p.m. Uh, for working families, that's, that's kind of hard. And me, I mean, I, I can usually slip away, but um, if I had other neighbors, because obviously I don't want to just show up in a meeting by myself, especially if neighbors are for or against something, um, is that not something that, that maybe in the future that we could advocate for to have maybe these meetings in the evening? Um, you may. I, I don't have any power over that, unfortunately, so I don't know how the process would work to change that. Um, so the zoning commission meeting is during the middle of the day. And so sending something written in, especially if it's from you through the neighborhood organization, that still carries a lot of weight. You don't always have to be there in person because we understand that people, mm -hmm. they can't get time off and everything like that. Um, the other thing to note is the council meeting. So there's two public hearings. The first one's the Wednesday at 1 PM and the second one's Tuesday at, and that's usually at 7 PM at night. So mm -hmm. it's kind of, we have those two separate times to allow input as possible yeah okay that's good to know i mean i, I like to do stuff face to face so yeah. people know uh that Roma, rosemont is uh, active and engaged um and then uh i i think that was my last question oh my <laughs> statement um if and it'd be uh if you could get your appointed person from the zoning commission to so if you can make the introduction uh for our neighborhood association to also have a friendship uh, with that appointed person, just so they understand who Rosemont is and who lives in Rosemont, I think that would be very beneficial for that person to know uh, when they are up there uh, thinking about our neighborhood. I'm sure that she would entertain any communication that you want to send her to introduce yourselves to her. Um, I think she does look when I was the zoning commissioner, when cases would come before me, I would physically drive around the city and look at the cases. Um, I was very knowledgeable about registered neighborhood associations and, and their activities. So I think that she is similarly um, in tune with, with the district that she represents. And Fernando, you and Susan and the rest of the board that's on, it's always helpful to be friendly with your council member and your commissioner before there's challenges but it also whenever it's in good times as well so i mean it is good i just wanted to know <laughs> that, that we got three notices this month and i was like oh okay there you go yeah i just it's good to know who who is representing us the process works laura see very good <laughs> La asoci asociación de vecinos puede estar involucrada y fue el mismo proceso que eh, explicó Laura uh, y es cuando mandan la carta pueden estar en organizaciones con el propietario o la persona que quiere cambiar la zonificación uh, y estar en comunicación con ellos también con la junta de directiva de zonificación. Uh, la otra pregunta fue. Si sí, podían hacer una introducción a la silla de zonificación para poder tener contacto con ellos. Am I missing? What was your second question, Fernando? I'm sorry. What was the second question that you had asked? No, la, la primera fue de developers y después la segunda fue. Ah, I can't remember. It was about the process. Process. He wanted, he wanted, he, yeah, he also wanted that comment. He wanted to make sure that the representative from zoning knew who for, who he was, I think, but the neighbor. Oh, not me. Oh, if, <laughs> if somebody didn't know who I was, they would definitely know. That. <laughs> City yeah. should know that by now. <laughs> then I got both of those. Thanks. You can go ahead, Catherine. I think our next speaker is. It is Anna. Hey. 
Does she have control already? Yes, now she does. Perfect. So our next person is going to be Anna Alvarez and she is with permits. Anna? Yes, hi everybody. Good evening. Um, my name is Anna Alvarez and I'm a plan examiner with the City of Fort Worth Development Services Department. I will be translating uh, my presentation as I go through it. Um, buenas noches a todos. Me llamo Ana Álvarez y soy con el Departamento de Desarrollo, perdón, de Servicios de Desarrollo de la Ciudad de Fort Worth. Um, y voy a traducir la presentación. Solamente está en inglés, pero voy a um, mandarle uno en español a la señorita. Um, Okay, so why do we require permits? Uh, the first things you think about, actually the, the important things that you think about are safety, health, and quality of life. Um, when you think about the building that you're in right now, um, whether it's your house or you're in your job, uh, maybe that's still up to your home, um, it has a foundation like we built uh, uh, wood or steel or concrete and so forth, uh, and you look around. So look around, do you see a clear pathway to exit the room that you're in? Do you maybe see some sprinkler systems or um, electrical outlets that you use on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, so these are all construction elements, things that, in, that require review uh, and compliance with the, right now we're in the 2015 and IBC and the IRC. Um, so I guess this, this presentation is mostly going to be for residential permits, but it applies to commercial as well. And I can answer both questions as well. Um, so the building codes are essential pieces of the building and construction process, outlining necessary standards of related to structural stability, fire and um, weather hazard protection, electrical wiring safety. Um, so we evacuation pathways, and there's so much more. Um, code officials are responsible for ensuring the safety and compliance of these codes and standards. Uh, they inspect building plans and construction processes to guarantee every building constructed uh, follows these sets of codes. Again, the 2015 IRC and IBC, that's an international residential code and international building code. Um, and it's all up on our website. So uh, what's more what we do, when our code officials, uh, when we're doing our jobs, um, we're ensuring building safety First uh, responders to these emergencies uh, have less to worry about and can do their jobs more, more safely. The inspections and reviews that officials conduct are preventative measures, if you will. So when a hurricane or a tornado hits um, or a wildfire spreads through a town or, um, and destroys a structure, if uh, it was built according, in accordance with the building codes, um, it's more likely to withstand disaster. Uh, saving you and the community uh, at large, you know, cost and time and uh, the pain of rebuilding. So, um, en español, para traducir, ¿por qué se requiere un permiso? Um, pues pensamos en la seguridad, la salud y la calidad de vida de uno. Ahorita, si usted está en su casa, uh, puede imaginar ahorita de su, el cuarto donde, donde está usted. Um, Tiene algún tipo de fundación, algún tipo de base y probablemente está construida de madera. Uh, ahora mire al sol, alrededor. ¿Hay, un, ¿Hay alguna manera para que usted se pueda salir si hay un incendio? Hay, um, también hay cosas eléctricas, um, enchufes o uh, plugins donde usted usa sus, uh, sus computadoras y todo lo demás. Todo eso es algo que... Eh, está incluido en la construcción de una casa o de un edificio. Um, sabía que cuando uno de estos elementos de construcción desde piezas eléctricas o plomería o de protección de los incendios um, tiene un punto de códigos de construcción uh, correspondientes. Y los códigos que yo mencioné, que la ciudad de Fort Worth está basado, es uh, el 2015 Internacional 
código residencial y código um, de edificios. Es uno de, de permisos residenciales y también permisos de comercio. Estos códigos de construcción son piezas esenciales para el proceso de edificación y construcción um, que describen los estándares uh, necesarios relacionados con la estabilidad estructural. Est perdón, estructural. estructural. Um, nosotros, las personas que uh, revisamos los permisos, estamos, uh, tenemos mucha responsabilidad en revisar los permisos en cumplimiento con esos códigos. Y es cuando los funcionarios encargados del código hacen su trabajo para garantizar la seguridad del edificio. Los, per, los primeros en responder a estas emergencias tienen menos de que preocuparse y pueden hacer su trabajo de manera más segura. Uh, piensen uh, si hay desastres con un tornado. El edificio, si es cumplido con el código que impulsamos, él es más uh, estable y requiere menos en costo para reconstruir o restablecer. Um, the next slide. So when do I need a building permit? Um, when you consider that building permits are required, uh, so it's, it's really easy to say that everything requires a building permit. The shorter list would be for me to say what doesn't require a building permit. Uh, everything that's listed here, additions, remodels, accessory buildings and structures, uh, separate permits, also for trade permits are required. Um, the things that don't need a permit are cosmetic work inside, like painting, flooring, replacing cabinets, uh, replacing plumbing fixtures, um, roof repair, unless you're replacing decking, um, fences under seven feet tall, unless they're in the front yard and in certain circumstances, flat work. We have um, in our administrative code this list. It's, it's not a long list compared to what requires a permit, but it's a list of things that don't require a permit and um, really anything about the census will require a permit. It will, that's what we say, but it's really just uh, when you think about like uh, foundation, flat work is flat work, right? Concrete, that doesn't necessarily require a permit. So when you think about what you're putting on top of it, that's when you probably want to think about doing a permit. Um, so, para traducirlo en español, um, cuando se necesita un permiso para edificar, hay varias, um, hay varias, varias condiciones donde usted necesita un permiso. La lista es muy larga. Cuando ve aquí, lo que tenemos es una adición, nuevo cuarto que quiere agregar a su casa, remodelos que incluye um, re reemplazando puertas y ventanas, uh, un garaje que lo quiere convertir en algo habitable, como un cuarto para una habitación, um, accesorios como uh, un tejabán o guardería o uh, cercas que quedan más de siete pies en altura, eso requiere permiso. Hay bastantes cosas que puedo um, definir que requiere permiso para la lista. Es más corta cuando le digo lo que no necesita un permiso. Y eso incluye el trabajo cosmético en el interior, um, que, que es como pintura o el piso o reemplazando un gabinete. Ese tipo de trabajo no requiere permiso. Pero si uh, cuando pensamos en interior, uno, uno piensa que puedo reemplazar el sheetrock de, dentro de la casa, eso sí re, requiere permiso. Es de, en muchos casos depende. Y es mejor hablar para, en vez de empezar trabajo um, para ver si necesita un permiso. Okay. Um, cerca de menos de siete pies de altura, uh, no necesita un permiso, al menos sea propone, propuesta puede ponerla en su yarda de enfrente. Ese sí requiere un permiso y uh, una vez es una sesión especial, pero eso voy a dejar que el señor Daniel hable de eso um, un poco después. Um, y esta es la lista, también la voy a poner um, para, en español para que sea uh, disponible. How does zoning impact a building permit? Uh, I know uh, Ms. Laura already talked about zoning. Uh, this is more specific to a building permit review. And it does have a map available right here that you can see is kind of the area which encompasses Rosemont. Um, I don't know if you can tell. This is in Butler, that's the railroad tracks, I think. Um, so when we think of zoning, when we're doing our review for, let's say, a house or 
the pole with an accessory structure in the back, a shed. Uh, zoning district impacts the building setbacks, the setbacks that are required for that accessory structure. Parking requirements, not necessarily, but building height, materials, the use, and then lot coverage, and the number of accessories you're allowed on that lot. Um, that's all taken in, into account. So if you were going to build something here in A5, your lot is the A5 zoning, so you're required five foot setbacks on each side and in the back, uh, depending on if there's any easements, but that's all in the, according to your submittal, whether or not your plat shows any easement. Um, so you're not allowed to build over those, but that's what we take a look at. So it's really important, like Ms. Moore said, that you take a look at your zoning for your property, your lot, and take that into consideration when you submit the building permit, your, what you're proposing to do. Um, sorry for the slide. ¿Cómo afecta la zona en, a un permiso de construcción? Pues, ya que la señorita Laura platicó sobre la zonificación y todo al respeto, podemos hablar más en detalle sobre su propiedad. Pensa, considera, considerando su propiedad, su lote, si usted quiere poner un edificio como una guardería o un tejaban en su uh, propiedad y la quiere atrás, consideramos eh, la separación del edificio, de esa estructura. Es decir, las, la separación de ese, esa estructura, esa, ese edificio a las líneas de su propiedad. Y en el lote que usted tiene, digamos que es uno de A5, que es un familiar, que requiere cinco pies de, de distancia a la línea de su propiedad, eso más defina que lo que usted puede poner. ¿okay? Y consideramos también si hay requerimientos para estacionamiento en su propiedad. También la altura de la estructura que usted pone, los materiales que propone a construir de ese edificio y el uso. Um, y también el, lo cubierto de, de su propiedad, porque más, eh, es más en la zona A5, que es cinco familiar o unifamiliar, que solamente deja 50% de cubierto en esa propiedad. Okay? Um, las clasificaciones de zonificación residencial y comercial e industri de industrial se desbordan aún más y tienen uh, regulaciones espe específicas. Um, no es decir que esto es lo único que vemos, pero en residencial es lo más común, okay? pero es diferente en comercial y puede ser diferente en industrial también. Uh, I didn't mention this in English, but it's not limited. So the zoning, it's not just A5, it can be impacted by any of the other places. So E, I guess industrial, some of their, it's in there too. Um, the regulations for those are specific to the zone. So you could be looking at setbacks that are more restrictive in certain zones than you would be in another one. Uh, so what are the steps a building permit takes? When we take into consideration right now, um, so when we were open at City Hall intake at customer service, it entailed the paperwork that would be reviewed by one of our technicians, and then the applicable fees would be paid at that time. Right now, uh, our process has changed with the pandemic. So our permits are all available online. You're able to, if you see on the right, the picture, to create an account and establish yourself as either a contractor or pull a permit um, by here apply for permit um, as a homeowner and uh, submit all of your documentation online. Um, the plan review aspect, uh, it's basically the review of all the plans that you're submitting for the structure that you're proposing. And the way it goes when we review everything, I guess to go back to when you submit online, the, our technicians, our, our development support staff will take a look at everything that you submit and make sure that it has, it's complete and it's ready for review from one of, one of the plan examiners like myself. And once it is, I will review it for compliance with the building codes. If any revisions are necessary, the permit will be placed into corrections required and it will be in awaiting uh, client reply. So you will have uh, an email or something letting you know that the permit it requires corrections. You should go back into your account and then upload required corrections. 
um, let's say after you know one time of revision, revisions are necessary, you submit, and then it looks good. I'm able to approve it. After that, any remaining fees that were not paid at the intake would be due. And this is something that really just applies to um, right now. If you're submitting for a new house, you submit, and your application has the square footages for every unit in that uh, in that residence, and it's applied but in my review i see that it was not miscalculated somehow i will recalculate those fees and there may be more fees incurred or maybe less and so the, our support staff would help in either a refund or you know we would pay out every whatever was remaining remaining um and then inspections um you there you can schedule those by phone or online online i think is easiest it's right here schedule inspections so it's all under this development um, tab. Finish. ¿Cuáles son las los pasos que sigue en un permiso de construcción? Um, cuando usted propone la construcción, tiene uh, sus planos listos. Um, antes era más era fácil entrar a la oficina y someter todo a uh, su, su solicitud y la aplicación y todo. Um, para entregarla a una persona. Ahorita nuestras oficinas no están abiertas y en este momento todos los permisos que usted uh, necesita y tiene que aplicar están disponibles en uh, nuestra página web. Y aquí es, al lado puede ver lo que, en dónde se puede uh, empezar la solicitud. Aquí también hay un lugar donde enseña lo que usted necesita para someter todo uh, por web. Ok, los documentos y cómo debe de ser. Y aquí también es, hay una tutoría donde si usted quiere ver a una persona registrarse como contratista o uh, registrar su cuenta para, su, para la solicitud, lo puede hacer. Ok. Um, además, eso cuando digamos que ya, ya tiene su información y su, uh, sus planos para someter, empieza todo este proceso y somete toda su aplicación. Después, cuando nuestro... Um, equipo de, de, soporte, de soporte, eh, verifique que todo está en orden y tiene sus planos listos para um, revisar un, un, plan, un uh, examinador como soy yo. Um, ellos distribuyen el permiso uh, después de que usted pague uh, la, lo que se requiere el permiso, el costo del permiso. Y cuando yo reviso el permiso, la, los planos de de construcción, como le dije, lo voy a revisar en, con cumplimiento del de código 2015 de, um, del Building Code y el, el IRC también. Um, y si, si cualquier razón hay necesidad de más información, el permiso se pondrá en, uh, eh, en espera. Va, vamos a poner una condición para que usted sepa que necesita más información o el permiso no cumple con un, una manera de, del código o algo que tiene que ver con el código y usted entonces se conecta a su cuenta y pone esos um, um, y somete sus revisiones o yo los reviso y cuando está completo el permiso yo lo puedo aprobar y en ese entonces cualquier um, costo del permiso si hace falta que pague lo paga entonces y después puede pedir sus inspecciones um, por teléfono o por es, esta página. Um, ahorita no está traducida en español, solamente está en inglés, pero creo que podemos, podemos traducirla, no sé. Eso depende del departamento, pero yo puedo verificar. Uh, y después pide su final y ya está completo el permiso. So, customer service. What do I need to apply for a building permit? Um, these are the, I guess it's a kind of a checklist of what you would need um, for a residential building permit. Uh, the application uh, for new construction is applicable and remodels and accessory structures. Um, monotony checklist, that's available online. It's in one of our pages. It's only for new construction, not remodels or accessories or additions. It's really just new, new housing. 
um, the residential new construction checklist that's also available on our website. Uh, that's uh, required for new construction, not for remodels or accessory structures or additions. Um, the plat is required for, so it should be for, yes, for new construction, not for remodels, but for accessory structures and additions, it is required. Uh, and the plat you can get at the county clerk's office. Uh, we have our website um, information with, that can connect you. Uh, and then complete set of plans, something that you'd be looking at for new construction. We have a checklist online that you can go by and we can make that available. I do believe it's in Spanish, so we can make it available um, to you all as well. Um, for remodels, a complete set of plans is a little different, but that's also listed on our website as far as what's required. It's more extensive, of course, when we consider new construction than a remodel of what a complete set of plans is. Um, and then accessory structures also, complete set of plans is required. Site plan is required for all. And the energy code compliance, if you're adding uh, conditioned or heated space to, you know, for new construction, it's applicable always. But for a remodel, it just kind of depends. Um, how much you're affecting. And then there's also ways for our, the plans examiner to talk to you about com of compliance with our prescriptive requirements for the city. And then accessory structures. That just depends if it's a hazardous accessory meaning we would be required to comply with the energy code. Um, but not so much for a shed. Um, we, we wouldn't be. Or a carport or uh, a structure like that. It's not happy. Um, para traducir es esta información, este, ¿qué se necesita para la solicitud? Es bastante información sobre si, si, si pensamos en una nueva construcción, lo que se necesita es la aplicación, una checklist que es una lista, um, es, es algo que dice que usted va a cumplir con, uh, cierta, en, de cierta manera con el, uh, la ordenancia de zona, porque no en la ciudad de Fort Worth uno no puede tener una casa que se ve igualita a la de al lado y este monotony es para asegurar que usted no va a construir una casa que se ve igual. Um, pero está disponible en nuestra uh, página web y no creo que está en español, pero es, um, es algo que podemos ayudarle, la persona que está revisando su permiso o, o uno de nuestros um, del equipo de, de support. Um, también se necesita residencial, uh, no, una vista de la, la, lo que cumple con su paquete, que es de nueva construcción. Um, un plan, es un plano de la vecindad, y eso también se, eso lo pueden um, sacar eh, con el, creo que es comfort, uh, no acuerdo la palabra pero está disponible también esa información en nuestra página web. Y um, el paquete de los planos, eh, el, lo, con, lo que se requiere es una, un completo plano de la construcción, de cómo se va a construir su casa, de el, también el site plan, se necesita el plano de la propiedad um, y cumplimiento con el código de energía. Y para remodelos es un poco diferente, se requiere un poco menos que una, una casa nueva, pero unas veces sí vemos que se necesita um, cumplir con el código de energía. También unas veces se necesita un plano de su propiedad con sus planos y también los planos, dependiendo del trabajo, si es un remodelo que es como, por ejemplo, está uh, reemplazando las ventanas y las puertas de su casa, sería un plano de, del piso, um, enseñando cuáles van a ser reemplazadas y, cómo, y las dimensiones de cada cuarto. Es un poco específico, pero um, casi siempre hay, alguien está disponible para explicar. Um, y también igual para lo, las, estructura, las estructuras accesorias. ¿no? Uh, so, plan review. Many of the projects other than uh, new construction were done as walkthroughs. Right now, our numbers for plan review are um, pretty good. From what I hear, I think we're running about three to five business days for first uh, comments on building permits, and that information is available online as well. It's, uh, it's a part of our statistics. 
Um, but the way that they were done when walk-in permits were done, uh, you would go uh, into the office and you would be able to get your permit same day. Walk-in permits included accessory structures, certain additional, all additions in residential and um, remodels. Uh, right now, uh, like I said, walk-in permits, you can't really walk into City Hall. So what we're doing is you can do um, walk in so you can apply online and that permit will be reviewed within the same time as other permits um but funds examiners are available to assist by phone or webex if you have any questions regarding any of those uh, permits uh, so it we re will re again review for compliance with building codes and then check for the zoning requirements um on these permits, we do both reviews, and then we answer any questions about that process. Um, in this, in esta información para traducir, estamos hablando de el reviso de un permiso que es um, eh, al mismo día lo podían sacar. En eh, esas estructuras um, eran más fácil para revisar y aprobar en el mismo día, y ya que no podemos entrar a la oficina para someter estas aplicaciones y estos um, permisos. Uh, uno puede poner su, hacer una cita para, um, por teléfono o por WebEx para platicar con una persona sobre lo que se requiere el permiso y también um, el tiempo que se va a durar para revisar ese permiso. Ahorita um, es, eh, tenemos creo que tres a cinco días cuando estamos revisando los uh, permisos para ser aprobados. Sería, um, yo diría que con buen tiempo todavía. No es un día, pero sí lo tratamos de... Um, aprobar lo más pronto posible y lo que estamos revisando como le, le dije anterior en, en el otro um, slide es que estamos revisando con cumplir, que cumple uno con los um, códigos de la estructura y también estamos verificando que usted está cumpliendo con el, de, el distrito de zona que la señorita Laura ya, ya platicó sobre eso y también estamos disponibles por teléfono y también por web para platicar sobre su permiso um, y responder a sus preguntas. So then after that, we're doing inspections. After the plan review and you get approved, it's inspections. And this is just a slide that shows uh, for remodel and addition what inspections you'd be looking at. We have a So it's really brief as far as uh, what's required. This is this information is actually available online as well. And um, we have uh, our phone system that you can do them on. These are the codes. These are just for information. If you need them, we can send them out. Um, but doing the inspections online is a lot faster and a lot easier because it's applicable to your permit and right away. Um, it doesn't, it, es básicamente una um, lista de las inspecciones que necesitan el, los de modelos y las adiciones. Es requerido que uno pida esas inspecciones y esos son los números de, de, de que entra si usted está hablando por teléfono para hacer esa inspección. Um, pero está disponible también en nuestra página web. So, Residential Board of Adjustment, that's going to be next. I know Daniel's going to talk a little bit more about that, but that this just applies when a permit doesn't meet the requirements for the to meet the zoning ordinance. And so we have to direct them to the Board of Adjustment for variance of anything. So I will let him speak about that. Este, esta información so, solamente se trata del um, el borde de ajustes que el señor Daniel va a platicar sobre um, con más información. Es, esto es um, más necesario cuando uno solicita su permiso para construir y no cumple con los requerimientos de la ordenanza de zona. Question, okay. right to call. Uh, preguntas. I don't know how to get out of this. Video. You uh, did have one question. It, what is the ratio of neighbors coming to get permits versus contractors? La pregunta era cuánto, uh, cuál es la diferencia entre personas que vienen a pedir permisos o contratistas? So there's, we can get that information out, we can do a report, but there's no real way for me to tell you that just with information that I have. Um, I see, because I'm only one of maybe 20 total funds examiners, 
and we're all reviewing. And really, I can just say I have a lot of homeowners and I have a lot of contractors submitting. Um, no hay manera de responder a la pregunta que, que con certeza, porque ahorita yo soy una de 20 um, examinadores y yo sé que yo reviso muchos permisos y como mitad son de, um, de propietarios y la otra mitad serían de contratistas. Lo que sí les puedo decir es que um, si uno no es el propietario, si no tiene el, los papeles de esa propiedad, uno tiene que registrarse como contratista para hacer el trabajo en esa casa. So what I just said in, in translated English is if you are not the homeowner and you were proposing to do work to that residence, to your residence, you have to apply as a, a contractor, register as a contractor to do the work. That, any other questions? Hey, Anna, I got I got one question. Um, with so many of our neighbors uh, in our neighborhood being very handy, um, what what happens to say if like some of our neighbors have done stuff without getting a permit first? Like, what quote repercussions are there? Um, well, so we have a lot of that and. It really just depends. Sometimes people get away with it. No permit ever um, uh, applied for. But you, we have a lot of code compliance officers and a lot of inspectors that will go out there and red tag something or give them notice that they need to pull a building permit. And at that time, it depends on how many notices they've been given, um, whether or not they'll give them a citation to go along with that. But um, also, you could be be double when you come in for that application for that building permit and really it just it depends i know um if you're wanting to do work i, I think it's easier to just get the building permit to avoid in, incurring like double fees for uh certain things oh and para traducir la pregunta la pregunta era hay bastante gente que puede hacer el trabajo por sí mismo en su casa y qué pasa si uno hace el trabajo sin un permiso pues puede ser que nada, nada pase, uh, pero si un uh, oficial del código de cumplimiento, como ya um, platicaron antes en esta um, eh, plática, este, dijeron que les dan multa o les dan notificación que usted necesita aplicar para el permiso y, eh, y empezar ese proceso. También tenemos inspectores en nuestro departamento de desarrollo que si ellos están uh, inspeccionando a uh, una propiedad al lado y ven trabajo uh, en su casa y ven que checan el, um, el sistema y no ven un permiso, ellos pueden ir y también darle multa o de decirle que no puede seguir el trabajo y que tiene que sacar ese permiso, la solicitud para ese trabajo. Es solamente depende, pero si es mejor uh, empezar su solicitud para um, el permiso para hacer el trabajo antes, porque también algo que tiene que considerar es si usted lo está haciendo para cumplir con el código de edificio, el building code. It's one thing I didn't um, say in English. You want to make sure you get a permit before you do any work because we're verifying that you're complying with the IRC or the IBC, which are our building codes. And if for whatever reason you don't comply, you'll have to tear everything down and build back if you want. Ana, también gracias por traducir la presentación. De nada. <laughs> Any other questions, Ruth? No. no. Okay, so before we go to the next one, I do want to just take a, a second to say thank you for Amy Connolly and um, Joanna Hudspeth from the Neighborhood Services Department. They're both um, watching and listening in. They are the Neighborhood Services Department, and they're the ones that facilitate and manage the entire NIP program. So they make everything run together with all the different departments. So we're, we're glad to have them here listening in on everything. Um, and that just went to a different screen. Of course it did. So we wanna welcome Daniel. He's gonna come in and talk just a little bit. Um, and I just went to a different screen, Daniel. And he's gonna talk about variance and, and special exceptions with us. Take it away, Daniel. Daniel, I think your mic is off. Disculpe. 
Good evening, everyone. My name is Daniel. I'm a planner with the Board of Adjustment. Uh, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Daniel Guerrero y yo reviso planos por el, el Consejo de Ajustes. Eh, esta presentación va a ser solamente lo básico de lo que se incluye porque es un tema y situaciones muy vastas que sí pueden tomar mucho tiempo y aparte pues me gusta hablar. I'm going to give a real quick overview of the presentation simply because this is a very broad topic that has a lot of issues. The Board of Adjustment does do commercial variances since, uh, but I'm just going to cover residentials at this point since the Rosemont area is vastly residential and I, I really don't want to get into too much of the commercial sense. Um, we're going to go ahead and start with the definition. No one really knows our department until they find themselves in a situation to where they do need a special exception of variance. And uh, later on, we're going to see why. A definition of a special exception is a project that is looked at for the compatibility with the rest of the neighborhood. Again, we're going to look at some examples of what that is. Uh, variance is a process in which a person can apply um, what's called a, a variance. Uh, because they're not meeting the current uh, zoning ordinance. As Anna, if she's reviewing a permit, for example, for a storage shed that is too close to the rear property line, uh, it may have already been built. It, it could be too tall. Uh, the property owner may not be able to move it. The only other alternative is to apply for a variance. And that's when Anna uh, just uh, does a warm transfer over to our department. Uh, las definiciones de una excepción especial y variante son la siguiente. Una excepción especial es un proyecto que se revisa y comparado con el vecindario. En otras palabras, eh, la estructura o el proyecto, el proyecto que uno quiere cumplir, eh, ¿cómo se compara con el resto de la vecindad, con la calle? Sí, eh, un variante es el proceso de poder aplicar para poder estar fuera de un reglamento de zonificación. Eh, porque no pueden cumplir o no pidieron un consejo a, a, o no sacaron un permiso, se encuentran en una situación que van a necesitar un variante. Muchas personas eh, no conocen este proceso hasta que se encuentran en una situación uh, difícil. E, y vamos a seguir adelante con unos ejemplos. Some of the examples include uh, front yard carports. Uh, which spawned after some heavy hail in the late 90s. Um, and I, I, my disclaimers, none of these properties are in Fort Worth, so don't go tell on me with anybody, okay? Um, so we have some front yard fences. Uh, I will speak for my Hispanic people that we love our, our walls and we love our, our, our columns and we love our big old gates. Um, and um, and some solid fences in the front yard. This special exception was what I was referring to. How do these compare with the rest of the neighborhood on the block? See, and that's that's what you have to meet, and that's what the Board of Adjustment considers before they render a decision on your carport, on your fence, on your solid fence, or on the height of your fence. Uh, unos ejemplos de excepciones especial, uh, y antes de seguir adelante, eh, muchas de esas propiedades, esas fotos que están viendo ahorita delante de ustedes, no son propiedades aquí en Fort Worth, si es que por favor no se vaya de chismoso con su vecino. Eh, unos ejemplos incluyen los tejabanes para los carros en frente de las yardas. Eh, a los hispanos nos gustan nuestros, nuestras cercas muy altas, nuestras columnas muy altas, o las cercas están sólidas, eh, incluyendo, eh, hay ciertas propiedades que tienen caballos, uh, tienen borregos, eh, que también se requiere una excepción especial porque hay un requerimiento de pies cuadrados para el animal. Eh, si es que eh, parte de ir delante del consejo, un variante para estar fuera del reglamento para que puedan tener estas cosas, el proceso no es garantizado. Um, some of the variances are storage sheds that are too large, again, too tall, could be too close to a neighbor's property line. Uh, neighbors usually sometimes will turn another neighbor in because 
12 foot or 11 foot storage shed right up against the property line. They walk out to their backyard and all of a sudden they see these big structure uh, just there. Uh, bedroom additions to homes. Uh, what that does is that for every bedroom that you add to a home, you have to provide a parking place uh, to the house. Our, our current ordinance does not allow for parking to be on the driveway. Uh, additional parking not to be on the driveway. It has to be either on the side of the home or somewhere in the backyard if you have alley access or can get to the side of your house. Uh, swimming pools. Uh, with a lot of the new subdivisions, uh, swimming pools are, are very hard to come by because they have very limited lots or they have to put them on the side yard. Uh, swimming pools have to be 75 feet from the property line or behind the rear wall of the home. As uh, an example, uh, carports that are too close to the side of property line of your neighbors or carports uh, um, that are too large for what's allowed for your, uh, your home. Detached patios that are too large. Uh, the, the homes and the structures that cover more than 50%. So if you have a house, right, that was built, homes are typically very small. So, do you, folks like to add patio covers in the rear? They add uh, huge carports that, when the cars are not parked under there, then everybody sitting underneath it, which is you know, which is okay. Uh, however, when you add too many roofs to your lot and you cover most of your lot with a roof, uh, then that becomes a that becomes a, an ordinance issue. Uh, unos unos ejemplos muy variantes es una es un story cero al almacenamiento muy grande o muy cercas o muy alto uh, y cerca de la linda propiedad de los vecinos o del vecino de atrás o el vecino de al lado. Si adiciones a una casa, uh, cuando crece una familia, muchas de las veces se les hace muy fácil convertir el garage uh, a, un, uh, a una recámara o quieren poner dos recámaras uh, detrás en la casa, una adición. Uh, el reglamento de hoy en día que tenemos requiere que un estacionamiento se provee para el lote en, eh, para la casa, pero ese estacionamiento se requiere o al lado de la casa o atrás en el patio. Si es posible, cuando una persona quiere hacer ese proyecto o ya lo hizo sin permiso, uh, pueden pedir un variante fuera del reglamento para no poder proveer ese estacionamiento. Eh, tejabanes localizados al lado de una casa que están demasiado cerca a la línea de propiedad del vecino y eso sí se ve mucho en, en Fairmont. Eh, coberturas que están muy grandes eh, de lo que se permite para el tamaño de un lote. Sí, eh, una casa o una estructura que cubre más de 50% que se incluyen los techos. Sí, eh, muchos tienen patios, coberturas atrás, o sea, en tejabanes para, para disfrutar del clima, las fiestas. Cuando hay un techo eh, combinado que cubre más del 50% de lo que es el lote, entonces es tiempo de un variante o se tienen que remover las estructuras. Eh, when you have a special exempt, uh, when you seek a special uh, variance, there are some risks involved. Uh, number one is a public hearing. So our department also sends out notices like the zoning department. Uh, the risk with this is, is that the, sometimes there's some dirty laundry that one neighbor that is opposed to a variance will come out and publicly tell on their neighbors about this, that, and the other, and the neighbor this, and the neighbor does that. Uh, and all this is public record. And so there's the risk of, of that. If, if, you know, we, we have had neighbors argue amongst themselves, uh, among themselves within the board. Uh, the other risk is that your case gets denied. Um, our fees are not small fees. Uh, whether you win or lose, you don't get any of your money back. Uh, if you lose, you don't you lose your money and you get you don't get to do what you want. Or um, in, in some cases, the board has ordered structures to be demolished. Okay, uh, literally just taken away. Uh, so. Before, before I continue in Spanish, the, we're going to get just in, in, in a couple of slides. You, you'll see what some of these alternatives are. Uh, ¿Cuál es el riesgo de una excepción especial y un 
El riesgo es que es una audiencia pública si es que un vecino puede ir contra de usted en una audiencia pública y así todos ya van a saber qué es lo que está pasando ahí en la vecindad. Ahí se va a soltar toda la sopa, como se dice, ¿verdad? Eh, eh, el caso de ustedes se puede negar. Eh, si se niega el caso, se reembolsa el dinero. Si es que pierde la cuota que se pagó por la aplicación y a la misma vez, si la estructura ya está, se va a tener que modificar, cortar o simplemente se va a tener que remover de la propiedad. Eh, so, special exception variance, what is the criteria? Uh, would the little of the zoning ordinance prevent you from building what you want? What does that mean? If your case were to get denied, would you not be able to still build a storage shed? You know, in your backyard. In most of the cases, that's not the true. You just have to meet the ordinance to go ahead and build that that's that's that storage shed. The hardship self-imposed. Uh, did you do this to yourself, for example? Did you build something uh, your contractor told you he got a permit and never did? Uh, uh, and, and in these cases, you're still responsible as the property owner to get something like this. Um, one other case where, where hardship may not be imposed is if a home that has a steep slope in the back of the, of the lot, forcing the house to be moved forward, and you would probably need a variance for that, and vice versa. You have a slope uh, way in the front that you have to scoot your house maybe to the side or the other direction that would trigger a variance. Uh, those are not self-imposed. Those are just some examples. Um, uh, what you're doing, does it injure the adjacent property? Uh, is my overhang on my carport so much so that all, all my rainwater is going to my neighbor's house instead of my own property? Uh, if a storm comes and my storage shed just flies out because it's too close, if it catches on fire and it's too close to a fence, does it injure that property that way? Um, are you trying to build something that is against the city ordinance? Are you trying to build a, a, a small manufacturing office in your because you want to make uh, bracelets uh, to the point to where you're starting a business in the backyard? So it's, that's, a, that's just some, uh, some examples. Um, so what is the next step if you win uh, your, your case? If you win your case, you get a permit if it's applicable. And a uh, carport, a patio cover. Uh, if, you get, if you were to win your case for a five foot fence in the front yard, you wouldn't need a permit for that. That, that doesn't count because we don't require a permit unless it's above seven feet. Uh, the board could say, we approve your front yard Airport, but we don't want it at 20 by 20, we'll go ahead and approve a 15 by 10. So at that point, the request is modified and then you get your permit for the structure that never had a permit to begin with. And then you just make those modifications. If you lose a variance, you cannot come back for two years with the same request. Or, or you can sue the city of Fort Worth in an appeals court. Our board decisions do not go to city council. Uh, unlike the zoning commission, where the zoning commission can recommend approval or deny the zoning case, the board of adjustment decisions are final. And the only way you can try and get one overturned is if you take us to an appeals court. Uh, so on top of losing your money, now you have the extra expense of paying for a lawyer uh, to go before a judge. Uh, ¿Cuál es el próximo paso ya que su caso, el caso es eh, obtener un permiso, si es lo que se necesita. Eh, en muchos de los casos nunca hubo permiso. Eh, si hay una modificación a una estructura, entonces a ese, a ese tiempo se tiene que hacer. Simplemente remover una estructura que si en el pasado si ha, el consejo ha, ha dicho, eh, declarado que, que si una estructura no fue aprobada se tiene que remover o ajustar para estar de acuerdo con los reglamentos. Eh, si uno, si una persona pierde un caso, no puede ir delante del consejo por dos años con, uh, con la misma petición o puede demandar a la ciudad delante de un juez. Nuestros casos no son como los de zoning, de zonificación. No se van al consejo de, de, de la ciudad de, de Fort Worth. Eh, simplemente las decisiones del consejo de nosotros son finales. Y la única manera en que uno puede apelar es delante de un 
y un consejo. Eh, y eso, y ya sé que es mucha información rápidamente, pero sí es un, es un tema muy grande, eh, muy costoso, eh, eh, sí causa a, a un nivel de estrés para muchas personas. Uh, this is just a brief presentation and overview of Board of Adjustment, simply because it's a very vast subject that, um, that can cause stress, causes money. Um, it, it, some of the things that the board has ordered people to, to come down, usually uh, if a person doesn't comply, it, it, could, it could lead to fines by either a city inspector or code enforcement after the Board of Adjustment has made a decision. Um, you have the information on the screen. Uh, you have myself, my email address. You have a planning assistant that is also bilingual that you can reach out to via email or, or uh, telephone. Uh, our application is at this time. Everything can be emailed to the Board of Adjustment inbox or it can be directly emailed to our sites. And that is the presentation. And I'll be more than happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Hernando has one question for you. Shoot. Oh, so Daniel, en mao este un statement. Este, sí. gracias por este la presentación este increíble que que diste ahora en español e inglés. Ojalá este la ciudad tuviera más presentaciones así bilingües. Sí. So, muchas gracias de verdad por eso. Solamente una pregunta si tenía te para los vecinos que que tienen, yo no sé si tú dijiste que si tienen animales este en la propiedad, que si son como gallo, gallina, lo que sea, este hay algo un código, algo que alguien tiene que seguir, este o se puede permitir de los animales o algo así. Yo, yo creo que tú de, dijiste algo de eso, pero no estoy seguro. Sí, uh, the first statement he made was that he would hope that in the future the city would have more presentations that were both in English and Spanish. The question he posed was an animal question, more specifically to chickens. Um, <laughs> so I will answer that question. Uh, 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 you, uh, I, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're allowed 10 chickens and two roosters by right. Anything more, yes. you, can go, more <laughs> you have to go to uh, animal control and you apply for a special exception with, with, with animal control. Uh, but si uno quiere gallinas, eh, invíteme al mole. Me encanta el mole, por favor. Eh, se permiten 10 gallinas, dos gallos eh, eh, sin tener que tener permiso. Eh, pero si quieren más, tienen que co comunicarse con el departamento que da la licenciatura para los animales. <laughs> Y entonces ahí pueden pedir más animales. Eh, el departamento de nosotros eh, gobierna animales grandes. Uh, our department does not govern chickens. It governs large animals such as sheep, uh, large pigs, uh, <laughs> horses, bison. Um, and so we have, we have rules that go along with large animals. So. Fernando cannot even keep a straight face. If oh, only he knows how many phone calls that our office receives with questions like that. So, it's, it's it's serious. Serious. Good with this presentation, he's very thorough and, and covers all. He's awesome. He's awesome. <laughs> You've done a great job. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's see if we can maybe get this going here. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Ruth and I were just uh, commenting that one thing that we will be doing um, for anyone that's watching this or that will be watching it in the future, we're going to put timestamps on all of the presentations. So if you want to go back and watch something, you'll be able to go straight to the Board of Adjustments uh, presentation and look and see what Daniel went over. So it'll be there for you on the website under the NIP program. So next up, uh, our last speaker is Zach Hutchinson, and he is with the Planning and Data Anal Analytics Department, and he's going to go over the comprehensive plan. All right, good evening. Um, as Catherine mentioned, I'm with the Planning and Data Analytics Department. So this is a new department that was, I guess, it was started in January 2020. Um, really, the comprehensive planning section came from the former Planning and Development Department which is now development services. So 
there was a lot of change, but uh, my team and I work with the conference of plan primarily. Um, so we're going to go through um, just some high level points about the conference of plan. Um, unfortunately, we won't have enough time to get into all the details, but hopefully it gives you a better picture of what the plan covers and what it is. So starting off, the, the question we should ask is what is a conference of plan? Um, so generally speaking, it's a way to communicate important concepts um, that are ultimately made to help decision makers guide development within the city. Um, it's updated through compiling information from a lot of city departments. So all the departments that have been represented here tonight, plus others that aren't here, have something to offer when it comes to providing information for the conference of plan. So the plan is broken down into different chapters and each chapter generally follows a department's um, sort of area of expertise or special knowledge. Um, so we, as the conference of planning section, we gather that information from each of the departments um, we try to get it, you know, as up to date as we can. Um, in some cases, there are other entities outside of the city that provide information to us. I want to go to Tarrant County Public Health. So that's why it's so important for us to have relationships with other bodies that are, you know, not just city, you know, organizations, but organizations outside of the city. So um, a lot of inter intergovernmental um, cooperation is needed. Uh, there is um, an annual update to the conference of plan uh, each March. So as our team compiles and puts it into a presentation, or it's a document that can be found online. That's that's adopted by city council. Um, so like I said, it's a broad vision for the city. Um, and if you want to uh, go online, you can actually view the 2020 conference of plan and it's provided to you in the link there at the bottom. So, él es, um, Zach está con el Departamento de Planificación y Datos. Um, so, ¿qué es el plan de comprensión? Es un guía general para tomar decisiones sobre el crecimiento y desarrollo de la ciudad. Uh, datos de varios departamentos dentro de la ciudad y fuera de la ciudad, como en el condado de Tarrant. Uh, presenta una visión amplia del futuro de Fort Worth y describe las principales políticas, programas y proyectos para hacer uh, realidad esa visión. Uh, el plan se actualiza anualmente y había puesto el sitio de web donde puede encontrar ese plan y actualmente se renueva cada año con información dentro y fuera de la ciudad con varios departamentos. This slide shows generally how the conference plan is broken down um, into chapters. So there's different parts that you can see here that are more or less themes to the conference plan. Um, like I said, you know, in my last slide, that a lot of these chapters really kind of come out of each department. So uh, it's not a one for, one for one match, but a lot of the content that we have, um, you know, will be, we'll consult with neighborhood services or um, code compliance or historic preservation to get information and then put that into these chapters. So the chapters that are uh, have, that are green, highlighted in green um, are being updated this year. So last uh, the last update for these were 2012. So obviously it's been a long time um, coming for us to actually get these updated. Um, unfortunately, we can't update every single chapter every single year. That's a lot of a lot of work um, that would take a lot of manpower. So uh, we try to get as many updates as we can. The chapters that are in blue um, have been recently updated. Uh, eventually, our goal would be to get every single chapter up to date, but that's probably not going to be feasible, but uh, we try to, try to stay on top of it as much as we can. Esta es la tabla de contenidos de el plan de comprensión de la ciudad. Um, cada departamento pone su información y este departamento hace los planos. Um, los capítulos con contornos verdes se actualizarán este año y los azules son capitulados actualizados recientemente um, desafortunadamente no se pueden actualizar todos el mismo año pero tratan de la mejor manera de actualizarlos uh, como se puede y hacer diferentes partes cada año and this slide is just the cover of the 2020 comprehensive plan uh, this is an example slide from some of the intro chapters and one of the things that our team has tried to do uh, more recently is use infographics to help communicate 
concepts and themes to the public. Um, in past years, there was a lot of text in each of the chapters, which can really become, you know, difficult for someone to, to digest all at once. So using graphs, charts, maps, things like that really do help communicate uh, what we want to to the city. Um, these are some examples of building permit activity as well as household statistics. So you can um, see that in the plan, but these are just snippets. So don't, and they're also very high level. So they're nothing that you can really dig into related to Rosemont. Uh, varios de los capítulos actualizados incluyen infográficas que facilitan la asimilación de la información. Uh, aquí se muestran algunos ejemplos de gráficos que muestran la actividad de permisos de construcción en toda la ciudad y estadísticas de hogares. Uh, esta información es de alto nivel y es mucha información. So, han puesto infográficas para hacer que esta información sea más fácil de leer, pero actualmente, como hemos mencionado, es mucha información y bastante información sobre toda la ciudad, o so no específicamente sería sobre la área de Rosemont. Uh, the next slide here really kind of mirrors the previous slide. It's just a, an example of what, you know, one chapter in particular shows. So this is housing. Um, I'm sorry, that was, actually, we go back, maybe one more. There we go. That's the transportation chapter. Um, general highlights, um, projects that are actually being completed and underway. Um, there's a purple link on this slide that's highlighted in red. Uh, this is pretty frequent throughout the new uh, updated conference of plans. So these are just areas where you can click and it'll take you to another page that has more information about that. Uh, por ejemplo, en el capítulo de transporte se incluye información sobre proyectos e instalaciones públicas. En varios capítulos verá un botón como el que se muestra arriba. Al hacer clic en este, accederá a más información sobre este tema en particular. So again, on this slide, uh, it's just high level statistics um, shown through charts and graphs rather than lots of paragraphs of text. So easier to consume. Um, this one in particular shows housing statistics. Esta diapositiva muestra ejemplos de cómo Forest se compara con otras ciudades a la región en términos de crecimiento y vivienda. El uso de infográficas se considera más efectivo para comunicar esta información al público en lugar de páginas a largas contexto. Uh, just more examples of information from the housing chapter. So this does show a map of um, activity citywide, and that's pretty common in the conference of plan. It's it's not as common to see um, specific neighborhoods represented in the conference of plan. I, I know that was a question from earlier, um, but really we want to try to focus on a larger scale citywide. So um, in some instances, you can find information about particular neighborhood projects in sections of the conference of plan, but it's not going to dig into too much detail. Uh, esta diapositiva es una continuación de capítulo de vivienda que ilustra estadísticas a lo largo del tiempo y los cambios en toda la ciudad. Um, es importante notar que el plan de comprensión es vasto y sobre todo la ciudad son específicamente sobre ciertos proyectos y vecindarios, uh, pero es información que también puede encontrar, no tan vasta como toda la ciudad. So the next set of slides will basically uh, show you the appendices that are at the end of the conference of plan. Uh, this first one is just um, existing plans and studies. También se incluyen varios apéndices del plan integral que proporcionan desglosis de proyectos y estudios específicos. And each of the appendices breaks down in more detail um, the specifics of that specific topic. Y cada uno de estos apéndices uh, se quebra más eh, y mira a cada parte uh, de la ciudad en diferentes, um, diferentes proyectos o usos o planes para esa área. Appendix C, uh, if you go back one slide, uh, will show, um, we'll show you the future land use map that we have for the city. Uh, what I've done here is just kind of zoomed in to the Rosemont Neighborhood Association outlined in green. Um, but you can't actually see, I mean, you can see Rosemont on a map in the comforts of plan, but it's, it's at such a small scale that, you know, you have to really zoom in and take some time to look at it. Um, so this is really just a, a large scale um, view of, of Rosemont. But again, kind of to, to go back to what Laura was presenting on earlier, you know, this is the future land use. So it's not, it's not existing zoning, although there's a lot of linkages between the two. Um, this is the type of development that's actually intended 
uh, for the neighborhood by parcel. So if you look closely, you can see the little rectangles. Those are parcels, um, you know, lots. So each one of those has a design designated land use. Um, so um, in this map, uh, yellow obviously is the most prominent color. That's single family residences. Um, purple is industrial, you know, on the western side of the neighborhood. And then brown, multifamily. So um, there's a legend on that as well that'll kind of give you more detailed breakdown. El, los siguientes mapas a la línea verde representa el límite de la asociación de vecinos de Rosman. A los mapas de uso de futuro de la tierra que se encuentran en el apéndice C identifican el tipo de desarrollo que se pretende que haya en esta área por parcel y cada uh, rectángulo representa un parcel. Los cambios de zona recientes pueden requerir cambios en el mapa de uso futuro de la de la tierra o del área para mantener el plan futuro consistente con resonificaciones aprobadas. El, amayor, el amarillo se refiere a viviendas unifamiliares, quiere decir solo una familia. En morado es industrial, el marrón es multifamiliar y el naranja es residencial de baja densidad. Este plan es de propiedad futura o de área futura, so no necesariamente es igual que lo que es ahora o de la zonificación de esta área en este momento. Zach, can you go ahead and tell them what the, the orange means, some of the different areas that you didn't cover? I know that was one that they were looking at. Sure, that's sent for low density residential. It's right up in the northern part there, right south of Barrie. Um, blue can is I jump in real quick on the, the orange part up by Barrie is part of the um, overall zoning that was done for the Berry Street Initiative. So we did some um, form-based code zoning um, and that comprehensive plan shows that form-based code zoning commercial along Berry Street and a little bit higher density residential um, along the railroad track and adjacent to just north of Barry, I mean, south of Berry Street. So that's what that kind of orange color is. I think the question was, when was that done, council? All right. It's been in the last, it's been since I've been on council. So it's, it, it was planned for years and years and years, but the actual charrettes that we did were in early 2016. Um, and a very public um, input process, similar, Fernando, to the Hemp Hill Corridor Task Force um, efforts that are going on right now. That all went on on Berry Street and adjacent properties to Berry Street. So, la parte anaranjada que ven hacia arriba del mapa es de baja densidad um, y eso dijo uh, la concejal que eso fue planeado cuando hicieron um, planes en la área de Berry y University um, hace varios años um, cuando ella empezó su carrera como concejal. And it sounds like Appendix C has a lot of interest. So Appendix C is, is focused on future land use. And if you were to go into the document itself, you'll see Appendix C divided up by sectors. So um, the south side sector obviously is where Rosemont is located. So you can look at that larger scale and then see projects policies that relate to that particular sector. Again, unfortunately, it's not only focused on Rosemont, but you'll see a larger picture of what's going on in your near vicinity. So, como hay mucho interés en la apéndice C, ese es parte de un sector más grande de parte del sur um, que puede ir en, en más detalle, pero lo pueden averiguar viendo el plan de comprensión. And then there's another question that came in: Where can we find more information on the Berry Plan? That would be probably in the Urban Village um, Plan, unless I'm mistaken. That's also on the city's website. Um, Unless someone can provide that link really quickly, I'll probably have to go find it. It is on the website. Um, we'll find it and we'll, we'll push that out. Because there's a whole separate page with just all the urban villages on it. All right, this page uh, basically just shows more information in Appendix D, so capital improvements. Um, this will be updated each and every year as new proposed uh, or funded improvements come along. 
Uh, se puede encontrar información adicional sobre mejoramientos de capital en toda la ciudad en el apéndice D. The slide just shows the outline of, uh, so the boundary of the Ro Rosemont neighborhood. Um, generally speaking, it's stable and steady population growth. En general, el vecindario de Rosemont está experimentando un crecimiento de población estable. And the next few slides will really just kind of give you an example of what the comprehensive plan shows uh, in terms of the, the mapping portion of it. So it'll provide statistics on housing, you know, income, um, age, that kind of thing. So these are just, again, focused only on Rosemont. So las siguientes páginas darán información sobre estadísticas de crecimiento, edad, um, de ganancias y mejoramientos para esa área. And we are, um, we ensure that all the data that we use is um, coming from a, a reputable source. So U.S. Census Bureau data obviously is the most um, commonly used. So ACS data, American Community Survey data, as well as, um, you know, I guess the Centennial Census, so censuses. Um, so next year we'll be getting some updated data that will be used in the 2021. 2022 plan, I suppose, at that point, um, which will give us just a more robust data set to work with. But what you see here uh, is a lot of this is projected out to 2045. So um, we do work with NCT COG, the North Central Texas Council of Governments, quite a bit as well, and use some of their methodologies to incorporate data um, to try to represent the public. So this is just an example of uh, median age. Uh, este, muestra, este mapa muestra la edad media por grupo de bloques de censo. So, varía de la información que tomamos. Um, va a ser como organizaciones de NCOG o del censo um, que va a ser actualizada a base de recibimos esa información. And again, this one shows median household income. So, just some really interest, interesting uh, maps you can look at and kind of drill down into on your own time. Este mapa muestra el ingreso familiar promedio por un grupo de bloques del censo. Uh, es información que es interesante que uno puede buscar en su propio tiempo. Um, improvement projects. So what's shown in blue there is within the Rosemont neighborhood. It's probably of interest, especially to the group. Áreas de proyecto están enseñadas en azul en el área del mapa. So I guess the question that most people have is how can I be involved in the comprehensive plan? And that's a great question. Um, it's important to keep in mind that the comprehensive plan is just that it's comprehensive. So there's a lot of high level um, work that goes into it. Our best recommendation is to be involved in activities such as this, to be involved in your neighborhood associations, encourage your neighbors to be um, involved in these kind of meetings, um, just so that way, you know, it works, it works from the ground up. So, the city um, does its best to incorporate uh, the public. So that's that's our goal, obviously. And the more we know of the public's needs and interests, that can then come into a document like the conference of plan. So, you know, unfortunately we can't, you know, spend a lot of time focused on one particular neighborhood, um, but your help, you know, you know, as a whole will be communicated and hopefully be implemented in time. La pregunta es, uh, ¿cómo puede un vecindario estar involucrado en el plan comprensivo de la ciudad? Y es por involucrarse, ayudar a guiar, a guiar la decisión. Y este solamente es un plan de comprensión. Y eso es lo que es. Puede cambiar estando involucrados uh, en discutir las actualizaciones de, del plan para una futura reunión uh, con vecinos. Uh, y tomar esa información, no solamente nos podemos enfocar en un área del vecindario, pero también tenemos que ver la área completa y el área de la ciudad. Pero podemos involucrar sus comentarios y información que ustedes nos dan para ojalá poder hacer un cambio dentro del área o de la ciudad. And we always love to, you know, hear from you as well. So if you want to reach out to us directly, you can do that. The next slide has my information as well as my manager's information. And um, really what we can do is put you in touch with the right, right people um, if you have specific questions about your neighborhood as it concerns a certain topic. 
Um, esta página tiene su información de contacto si tiene una pregunta y quiere saber más sobre el plan de comprensión. Um, you did have a question coming from Fernando is, um, so how is the comprehensive plan affected by the future city budget changes due to COVID? And perhaps um, council member Jada can also chime in on that. La pregunta era, ¿cómo el plan de comprensión es afectado por la, las propuestas del el presupuesto de la ciudad debido a cambios de COVID? I would say the comprehensive plan, Fort Worth is very unique in how it looks at the comprehensive plan every year. A lot of people do a long range plan and then don't touch it for many years. Um, I know that all of our departments are having to look at budgeting and are not being able to hire anybody new. So I think the only issues are going to be being able to do more proactive planning that we would like to do that may be limited, but I don't think it'll stop those currently employed from continuing to to keep the comprehensive plan updated. La ciudad de Fort es única uh, porque es una de las ciudades que mira el plan de comprensión cada año. Um, y debido a COVID-19 no, no hemos podido uh, emplear a otros empleados, pero no quiere decir que no vamos a estar viendo el plan y que sigan um, con el plan de comprensión cada año viendo cada departamento y trayendo información de ellos. I think that as the plan shows what the desire for the future is and whether that development happens quickly or slowly may be affected by the, the pandemic, um, but it's up to individual property owners who want to do things with their land in accordance with the comprehensive plan. Uh, a base con la pandemia, um, puede afectar en que rápido o despacio uh, se mueven con cambiar propiedades, pero eso totalmente depende del de propietario. Y si ellos quieren cambiar uh, su propiedad a base del plan de comprensión. We had another question come in. Is comprehensive planning open to the public? Uh, yes. So the, the process of planning is open to the public as well as the document itself. So that's what you mean then yes. But yes on both fronts. Uh, la pregunta era si el plan de comprensión está abierto al público y de dos maneras sí. Um, está disponible a la, al público, pero también está disponible para recibir comentarios sobre el plan comprensivo. It looks like there's been several questions too about whether or not the plan itself is in Spanish. Uh, I don't think it is right now, but I think that's a great thing to pursue. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't think anybody on our staff that I know speaks Spanish. So. How many pages is the total comprehensive plan? Well, it used to be a lot longer, but since we've sort of started using this whole infographic thing, you know, it wants the goal is for it to be short and, and consumable. So it was many, many pages in the past, you know, 10 pages per chapter, 20 or so chapters and, and appendices, that kind of thing. So you do the math, it's way too much for one person to read in the map. You know, I think I think it should be something that's a little bit more, you know, just readable for the public. It's nine o'clock. Ooh, my bad. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's good that it has pictures, probably longer in Spanish, but uh, I guess it'll be helpful during a pandemic to have something to read. Uh, <laughs> that's true, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, picture. we're all visual learners, so I mean, it's a lot easier just to look at pictures and get a better understanding of things. Yes. La pregunta era si el plan de comprensión estaba disponible en español y actualmente no está disponible en español, pero es algo que uh, podríamos ver si lo podemos hacer. La, el plan de comprensión es muchas páginas, tiene uh, 10 páginas por capítulo y son alrededor de 20 capítulos, um, pero comentaron que sería bueno de tener el plan de comprensión en, en ese momento. Any other questions? Don't see any that came in. Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, Zach. I just want to um, thank Ruth Aussie for setting all of this up and doing, a, as usual, a phenomenal job with all of her translations. All the departments who participated tonight, and especially having Councilwoman and Zeta here join us tonight. 
This video will be online um, within the next couple of days. It will also be on the Las Familias de Rosemont's Facebook page. Please encourage as many of your neighbors to view it. The presentation, um, all the presentations that were shared this evening will also be shared on our website. And we will work on the ones that have not been translated so far, getting those done as well. So if you need anything, if you have any questions about the program or about the community engagement office, you can always reach out to us at any time. Um, Ruth Aussie is your community engagement liaison for this area. And she would love to have you call and email, write, harass her as much as possible. So any parting words, Ruth? <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what just happened there. Um, <laughs> no, um, I just look forward to doing our next workshop, um, which is going to be with Chad, uh, and that's the Tarrant account of Tarrant County Appraisal District. Um, so I'm looking forward to that as well. So Perfect. nuestra siguiente presentación será de Chad y será sobre los impuestos de propiedad. Perfect. Y'all have a great evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Good night, everyone. Thank you.